hello everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Rough Trade, for inviting us uh, to have a very brief question and answer session with these two luminaries to my left. Ex luminaries. God, we don't mind. They're so God modest. Work. They really are modest. Thank you very much for coming. Because, yeah. Uh, everybody who buys, well, certainly my record, <laughs> has bought the hopes and dreams of a young man now coming out years later and any kind of record that you've bought is also the hopes and dreams of all the other people all the artists the engineers the producers the record companies managers they all love music and they've all put everything they know into these records and you've validated them and you've helped them all through the years that you've been digging music and buying it so thank you very much because it is all about you and it's not about us. Exactly. So anyway, without any further ado, on my left, we have one David M. Allen, Uber producer. Um, I think a lot of your record collections will have been polluted with his touch. Just to his left, another Uber producer, Phil Fornerly. By the way, they're both Uber songwriters as well, uh, which is also why we're, we're here today. So, when did you first meet? Dave worked at Genetic Studios out in the wilds and was recording uh, The Top. And for, the, for The Cure? For The Cure. And I had, had briefly been in the band, and I, or maybe I was in the band, <laughs> but I, w I was producing other people's records. And Dave it's going well, isn't it? <laughs> it was so long yeah. ago. Uh, Basically, me and Phil, Phil met remotely because he did the recording for a song called Love Cats. He did it in Paris and he played the bass, which we'll go into the chalk marks later on on the double bass. Um, and I got to mix it. And um, I can safely say I put all the faders up in a straight line and it absolutely sounded fantastic. So when something falls into your hand like a feather, you just go, thank you, God. And um, so we kind of met in that way as two kind of technicians or uh, producers, wannabe producers. And that record was very successful. Um, later on, we met incidentally. I then followed that up by working on an album called The Top for The Cure. And then I did an album called, uh, I recorded a live album called The Con called Concert, where Phil was the bass player in the band. So we've kind of had this kind of association. Love Cats was a great song. Yeah, it uh, was, yeah. And a How did you convince them to do like a pop song after the yeah. Maelstrom of pornography? Well, um, I think Chris Barry probably convinced Robert, or maybe Robert con convinced himself. Mm. Maybe Chris said it's the end of the line. It's the end of the line. It's time to like get on the radio. And mm. uh, it seemed to do the trick. It's you all like love cats, don't you? Who doesn't like love cats? Yeah. But just, just a bit of context to that. Um, Pornography was what the fourth album down the line, and Robert had obviously got to the point where he was very clear with Chris saying, We can now do this ourselves, we just need a decent sort of engineer co producer. And they found themselves at Rack Studios, where Phil was um, the sort of house engineer, and he got at the age of 21 the co producer gig for pornography, which obviously is regarded as one of the the huge maelstrom moments of the Cure's back catalogue um, until we obviously get to disintegration with Dave. I think one of the interesting things is it's in sort of Cure world, seeing as we plunged into that, is um, everybody in Cure world gets a nickname. Now, Phil's nickname was Da Vinci. <laughs> Would you like to say why that was? Well, I'd like to think, as many of you know, Da Vinci was a Renaissance man and um, capable of great art in any situation, any kind of media, and I happen to be a painter of sound. That's why I think I was called Da Vinci. I don't know actually why, but it was better than being called Steve. No offense to any Steves out there right now. And my nickname was Dirk. Yeah, how did that happen? Well, it's a very dangerous short blade <laughs> used for cutting things. Ooh. That's what I think. And I think Robert had this habit of nicknaming people, which was more to do with his psychological evaluation of the person he was dealing with. The best example of it is the early on, 
he had two assistants. The first albums were done by a guy called Mike Hedges, and they had two assistants, and Robert nicknamed one of them, who made tea all the time, Flood, and the other one, who never made tea, he called him Drought. <laughs> now, Flood's a very, very well-known and famous producer, and there are no producers called Drought, to my knowledge. <laughs> Bill was the name for the record company head, Chris Parry, which I think is probably because he paid the bills. Mm. But I could be all wrong about this because obviously I'm second-guessing someone with quite an enormous mind. Well, anyway, we're here partly because Dave has just released this um, splendid album called The DNA of DMA. David M. Four. Thank you. Mabel. Mabel, David Mabel Allen, which basically is his first jump into engineering and production at Genetic Studios under Martin Russian. Um, Dave will take over very quickly, but basically Dave was penciled in as a, a solo artist. Martin Russian, hugely successful producer of, of, of the 80s, The Human League, Pete Shelley, etc. Dave spent 10 days in Genetic all alone working on these tracks with the idea of becoming a solo artist. Um, and when Martin Russian got back from America, where he was, while Dave was putting these down, what he heard, he was so blown away, he said, you're working for me, which launched, I think, the, the career that we now all know. So, yeah. Yeah, so these, basically the band I was in split up, we usual musical differences. And um, the last track, I extracted a promise from Martin that we would do an experimental track and he had this thing, I didn't know what it was, it just looked very space age, and it was a System 700 synthesizer with a microcomposer, an MC8. There were only six in the country, they cost a fortune, 35,000 pounds, so it was enough to buy a row of houses in Stepney. Um, and I said, um, well, can we use that? And he said, yeah, because he'd never used it before, because all of his work was kind of punk work from the Buzzcocks, the Stranglers, Generation X, so all the bands he was getting offered were kind of guitar bands, but he really kind of saw the future as being an electronic thing. So we started trying to work out how to use this thing, which was really horrifically difficult. I mean, my background was that I'd done a chemistry degree, so science didn't kind of scare me and manuals didn't scare me. And we kind of did one track, which is really effectively the last track, uh, the second to last track on this record. Then there was an interim period where I tried to get out of my deal, the band had broken up, and he offered me 10 days studio time with the idea that the uh, maintenance engineer was going to help me out with any technical problems. Um, shortly before that, we did do a completely electronic track which he produced and really kind of nailed all the problems of working with these early type of machines. Um, although he was definitely the leader on that song and the producer of that song, uh, which is called The Sound of Muzak. Um, it was really very much of a joint effort between the two of us. And when he offered me the 10 days studio time, I was looking at, well, this is the end of my career. I either do this 10 days or I don't do this 10 days. These are my demos for my solo album, my new deal, etc., etc. And the day that I arrived there, the maintenance engineer left money. So that left me on my own. Um, I did know how to put a tape on the tape machine and I did kind of pretty much know how the whole thing worked because as I say, I'd, we'd done this single together, um, but I really had no idea. I mean, after the guy left, I spent nearly eight hours trying to work out how to plug a microphone, something like this, into the desk and make it work. I just couldn't get it to work. Um, but once I got it to work, I never touched any of the wiring, so I was kind of good to go for the next nine days. So every single thing that I managed to make work, I then never went back. So once I'd got the code onto the tape, managed to get it to play back, managed to get the machine to follow it, I just followed it like that. It was a bit moronic, really, in a way, but I was kind of like sleeping in the studio 10 days. Like Jimi Hendrix, I slept with my instrument. Um, but, but you like doing the drums and the bass and everything on with this? Yeah, everything. Yeah, everything was programmed in the MCA. It was the first thing that you could really um, emulate. Glorified sequencer. 
Yeah, anybody that listens to the record will immediately recognise the footprint of what was to come very quickly afterwards, like the smash hit that was Dare by the Human League, because it was done in the same studio with the same gear. Phil, you had the chance to start very, very young as a studio engineer going on to produce, and Dave, you had the chance very, very young to start as an artist, and you've kind of always both kept a hand in artistry, but... You've continued producing and you've moved in the last few years more into the sort of songwriting artist sphere. I think the last 30 years. 30 like, years, yeah. possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I always wanted to be a songwriter. Yeah. And then I got a job at 18 at, at a fancy recording studio in London. And then I became an engineer and then a producer. And then once I became unemployed, unemployable, I went back to to my first love, which was being a songwriter. So, and I managed to uh, succeed with that, thankfully. Well, as, as, as Andy was saying, Dave took the opposite route in yeah, some respect. Must be the chemistry degree, possibly. Yeah. Uh, well, I had a tape, tape recorder when I was 10. Can't beat that. So, yeah. um, funnily enough, because the very old fashioned way of editing tape was you would lay two pieces of tape over cut them with a pair of scissors so that the join was exactly the same on both bits of tape. And I discovered that when I was 11. Wow. And then 16 years later, Steve Nye showed me the proper airway of um, editing tape, which was the same. Very, very similar. So, but obviously that's called convergent evolution. Um, you know, the proper solution is the proper solution. And now nobody edits tape. No. Mm -hmm. You just hit uh, function E. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Straight well, days with a razor blade. Yeah, well, the only thing I didn't have was brass scissors. <laughs> Is that so why you, you were called Dirk, though? Maybe because you had the razor. Well, I don't know. When we did Love Cats, I mixed it once. That, you reminded me I did some brass on it, which I'd completely forgotten. I mixed it once with Chris Parry, the head of the record company, and Robert didn't like the mix. He didn't like the vocal sound. So um, they booked another session. Robert came out and uh, I reassembled the mix, which was very easy, thank you. And uh, I always used to use, and Martin always used to use, automatic double tracking on the voice, which I'd used because that's kind of what I'd been shown. And we put it up and Robert said, what are those two tracks? And I said, automatic double tracking on the voice. And his hand reached over, cut those buttons, and he said, yeah, that's it. That's what I don't like. And I went, great. And we printed it. And it was top five at Christmas. Went home, yeah. <laughs> Three times on top of the pops. So cut, yeah. It's also probably I've got a very vicious sense of humour, which is really misplaced. And uh, Robert's got a very Both cutting sense of humour too. So, so we were quite good at the fencing. How much of producing a band is actually just pure psychology and babysitting? Very much depends on the band. I think with a band like The Cure, my experience of working with them, they were well rehearsed, that everyone could play, had a, a, a the Robert, the lead artist, really knew what he was doing. He's a proper artist, he has a vision. And then you get other bands who are just wannabes. They might be quite good, but, but it's a different, you, you might end up having to teach them how to sing, how to get them in time, how to play the right chords. So that's a, that's a 180 degrees of, of experience there, Dave. When they need to go to hospital, take them to hospital, <laughs> make them coffee in the morning, <laughs> listen to them about their childhood. That was the most complicated bit about the 10 days because I had to take myself to hospital. I had to make my own tea. I had to tell myself that it was okay what I was doing. And then I had to uh, tune myself. I had to tell myself when I was out of tune I had to uh, feed myself as well. Um, so that's kind of really putting myself in two places, i.e. as the artist and as the listener, because that's ultimately what a producer is, a really, hopefully, a quality audience. So you are representing the audience. You're not really kind of... There's this idea that producers, and some of them do, the Phil Spector-type producers were very domineering, but really you're there to go hey look that that's good i like that i'm an ordinary person 
and I like that, ordinary people will like that. Um, how can we make it more ordinary? <laughs> uh, possibly. I mean, I, when we were doing the Human League, they really didn't like Don't You Want Me. Yeah, that's right. Phil, Phil I mean, it's the last it track was, on the album. He thought it was too poppy, didn't he? Well, it's the last track on the album and, you know, nobody does that um, anymore. But, um, yeah, they were kind of quite suspicious about it. Uh, but that, that song was um, done really over a weekend with Martin, me and Joe Callis, who wrote it. So it was a fully realised backing track. And then Phil, manfully, very undercredited, actually both conceptually on, on, in, in the Human League and with his ability with synthesizers and being able to kind of really get a concept for a group, which obviously was slightly borrowed from ABBA, but to uh, discover two people in a disco dancing and make them into kind of big stars, you know, he won the battle of the bands. Yeah, when you're, it comes you're talking to about Joanne and... Uh, yeah, Susan. Joanne and Suzanne, yeah. And very unprepossessing, no background, could barely sing. They were only 17, I think. Their parents, yeah. their parents yeah. had to sign the contract for them to go off on tour. Yeah, well, they were doing A-levels. Yeah. So they weren't around very much during the recording of their... But it's just interesting that, you know, because the other thing is artists don't really kind of know what their best stuff is very, very often. They might, for instance, be... My favourite track on the album is the, is the last one, Passion of Father Bernard, which could never be a single unless you were, I don't know, Martian maybe. We got, we got a very, very lovely review in Mojo this month, um, but they didn't like that track. Bastard. Ignore the last nine minutes of self-indulgence. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which to me is the most interesting track because one of the things you never hear on records is people fucking about with things. Uh, and that is me just really messing about with a simplistic program going and making all sorts of completely weird noises from the lowest noise you can make to the highest noise you make and just having fun with the reverb. And I was thinking to myself today coming here, it's a bit like when you're children, any of you got children and you watch them painting a picture and you watch the, how, much, how much they're digging doing that picture and then you take that picture and you frame it and you put it in your kitchen next to uh, Van Gogh and, and you like it as much. Yeah. You like it as much as Van Gogh or, you know, pick anyone you like. So it's that type of thing. And I think that happens a lot on records, that artists love a particular song because it's, it's their well, um, childish daub. Well, I mean, it, it, impossible to speak to Phil today without mentioning, obviously, the mega smash which was torn yeah. for yeah. Nat. I can. Oh, I'm not the only one. I'm Julia. Julia. How, how, I'm jealous, Phil. How, how how do you say her surname? Imbruglia. 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 Natalie Imbruglia's torn um, was co-written by Phil and people that he co-wrote it with actually put it out first and then some other people put it out so it, it had already kind of like traveled a bit around europe and the states before natalie took up the mantle and then you actually produced that version yes i did yeah, yeah it's one well, of those lucky moments well, when i i really wasn't wanting to mention the word sting here today but anyway sting who wrote every breath you take i mean which is now it's the most played record on US radio, the entire history of recorded music. And he's often said that he's tried to analyze what makes every breath you take this track uh, that is just so easily accessible to... Andy Summers. Exactly, yeah. Well, uh, that's a completely other argument. Being bitchy. <laughs> um, and he says, yeah, basically, madness lies therein. So I'm going to ask you the million dollar question where madness lies where they're in what makes your version of torn the one that did the business well if i may uh every breath you take it has a similar psychological formula because it's sweet on the ear the music is sweet on the ear but the lyrics are actually very dark yeah because it's about stalking yeah and everybody hears it every breath I take. oh i love this one and yet torn is similarly, the music is very easy on the ear, and Natalie's voice is very easy on the ear, but the lyrics are actually about a sort of t turmoil that everybody goes through, you know, like a, a crisis in their life. So you've got this um, bittersweet uh, confection of 
music saying one thing and the lyrics saying another thing. And I think that makes it, if madness lies therein, that, that's what I think makes it, thankfully, people still play that record. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to the elephant in the room, The Cure, I mean, if we had to take one track that kind of catapulted the band into sort of mass acceptance, it would obviously be close to me, which you were at the... As opposed to caterpillared them into anywhere. No, yeah. we like caterpillar, don't we? <laughs> no, but I, th I think close to me, it's kind of known as being the international hit in 85, Head on the Door mm. album that yeah. got them into the top 10 in several countries. You obviously produced it and more to the point mixed it. I mean, it has a very distinct mix and I mean, it's no surprise that the video was shot in a wardrobe because it's the whole song is about this kind of claustrophobic whatever and if mm. you listen to it on cans, it can be actually even quite worrying if you've had a couple of pints because it's... Ooh. So what... what Complimenty. What, 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 well... So what, how would you explain well, the that? Close to me is a classic thing because for, Robert gave me this brief. He said, this song is... You are in a wardrobe. Somebody oh, oh, so the wardrobe was mentioned before. You are in a wardrobe. Somebody's whispering in your ear and a band is playing outside the wardrobe. Now, that's a fantastic brief to give anyone for a sound picture. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the things he didn't want, he didn't want a snare. So I'd gone through this torture with Caterpillar about trying to get a backbeat onto what was essentially just a rolling tom feel. So um, in order to evade the kind of rule of no snare, there is no snare on it. But one of the tricks I learned with uh, one of my mentors, Alan Wynn Stanley, was that if you take a drum and you place it next to another drum, it will resonate in frequency. So where Boris, the drummer of The Cure at the time, was playing the tom with an offbeat, the snare that I put next to it would rattle. So I was able to mic the snare rattle up. Clever. Get a snare sound that evaded the conceptual problem of there is no snare. So there is no snare, but, but there is the sound of a snare. This is all before sampling and stuff. So, um, and the mix, Tim Pope came down to pitch the video on the mix. So consequently, while they were brainstorming ideas about the wardrobe, blah, 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 falling off the cliff, I did the mix. <laughs> and it was done. And basically... When you've got someone going, yeah, and I can see a wardrobe door shutting and you've managed to find a sample from somewhere. Actually, the door on it is the door in, um, on the 12-inch version, is the door at uh, Trident downstairs in the room with the uh, Let It Be piano in. Um, so it was easy because the whole thing was sold there and then. No angst, no neurosis. And because the whole thing had been engineered to sound kind of a little bit muffly, with someone whispering in your ear, um, it was really very easy to do. There's no reverb on the album version. There's no effects on the album version. It's just extremely claustrophobic. There's a little bit of reverb on the sim single version. It's just really to put a bit of reverb on it. Otherwise, what have I done? I haven't done anything. <laughs> All right, well, look, we're going to be coming up on time now. So are there, are there any questions from the floor? We've got just a couple of minutes left. Well, we've got some from the internet. If no, well, maybe these will inspire you. This one is for Dave because he produced the mythical first album of the Sisters of Mercy, first and last and always. Did you ever see Andrew Eldritch, the Sisters of Mercy singer, eat any solid food with cutlery while you were producing first and last and always? I've said this to Andy earlier on today. The only piece of cutlery I saw Andrew Eldridge use was a razor blade. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will inspire you to think of some questions, I'm sure. Okay, for Phil, when... Yeah. That was... Uh, uh, sorry, that was from Black... Because this is being recorded, by the way. That was from Black Planet in South End. Thank you very much, Black Planet. Um, Phil... When you joined The Cure on bass, did you see it as a permanent position or did you always know that it would be a temporary gig before you went on to other projects? That's from Fabienne in Lyon. I, I think uh, it, all my life I've never been backwards in coming forward. The, uh, Robert said, oh, Simon's left, we need a bass player. Do you know anyone? And I said, yes, I'll do it. So that's how I got... You, uh, you actually volunteered? Of course, oh. yes. <laughs> And uh, your first, best how, how are you going to live your life unless you take opportunities? You yeah, know? Yeah, so you've always got to say yes. Yeah, say yes. 
And uh, so I, I guess as, it was as easy to come in as it was to be kicked out. So uh, I think I always knew I was a, uh, what do they say, a place holder, something like that. I was just there, I had a great experience, and then <laughs> Spanish Archer, elbow. Uh, Dave, the Chameleons, who you, you, how many albums did you produce for the Chameleons? Two? Oh, I've done two, yeah. Two, yeah. The Chameleons are considered by many, myself included. This is from Shamrock01. I don't know where he comes from or she comes Ireland. from. Ireland. Probably. To be the ultimate cult band, revered by fans but unknown to the masses. Why do you think this is? My sister always said that they weren't cute enough to be in the mainstream press. Is she right? I mean, is, why is that question? Does this mean that all the chameleons ugly? Um, wow, that's um, the attractiveness of people in pop music is vastly overrated. Yeah, good Ed answer. Um, no, amongst many others, Boy George. I mean, he's six foot three. So, he, and sorry, that's a terrible thing to say. But it's, it's, this emphasis on looks is is really nonsense. Um, the chameleons they never wrote singles. Many people disagree with it, but they didn't really write singles. Um, and also, they weren't a very stable band. There were four extremely talented people who didn't really super agree uh, on anything, and uh, that weakens the um, that weakens the proposition. For instance, The Cure is a band, but Robert is the leader. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think, say, David Bowie made a mistake on Tim Machine uh, was he didn't realise he could be in a band, but you still need a leader. That's kind of my observation on the comedians. I mean, fantastic group, still sound really good. Yep. It doesn't really matter if the personnel change because uh, Beethoven has been dead a long time. No one moans that when they're listening to Beethoven that he's not around to play the piano. And um, we have obviously lived through a period of where the classic classical music in the modern era, like Beatles or the Stones, that's going to survive. Some of it will survive. So um, go and see all these bands because whether they've got original members in or not, the architecture of the music is what's great about it, not particularly who's playing what. I mean, you can make a case for Simon and The Cure because until you pointed out to me that he uses upstroke... Yeah, I was going to... I saw that. I was going to ask. I don't, I've never... I've never taking that on board. I thought it was always down, down, down. Okay, real, real technical moment here. Sorry, yeah. For geek. For geek geeks. alert. If you, everybody, when they play the bass, they might slap, or if you use a pick or a finger. But if they use a pick, they go like this. Dun, 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 dun. You go down. Dun, 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 dun. Even if you're just starting guitar, you go jug, 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 jug. But I seem to remember Simon plays, and nobody else does this. He goes up. Ding, 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 ding. It's a kind of a 50s. Almost a 50s. Yeah, yeah. Surf. Now. Yeah, it's a bit surfy. Thank yeah. you very much. What's your name? Uh, Chris. Hello, Chris. Oh, Chris. Hello. Questions I was really for David. Um, sound world of the top is really different to all the other Cure albums. It's kind of, well, not every track, but a lot of them yeah. are kind of really kind of wide and acoustic sounding. Yeah. Was that intentional? How did that come out? Um, I inherited the drums and the bass from another engineer called Howard Gray. Thank you, Howard. And, um, and I don't know. Is, that, we, what, is it just like one track that sounds like that? No, I'd say well, probably at least half the album. Like Caterpillar, um, Banana Fish Bones. Um, Banana, yeah. There's just, you know, kind of lots of acoustic guitars. Different drummer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, so basically the drummer changed because it was Andy Anderson on mm -hmm. Shake Dog Shake. And yeah, an RIP, great drummer. Yeah. And uh, the drummer on the next album was Boris Brainsby Williams. Um, and that's... You know, you build everything on the drums. If the drums aren't good or the drums are a certain way, then that conditions everything else you do on the top. So I did the drums on In Between Days and frankly had no idea really what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Howard Gray was a really fantastic engineer, I mean, possibly responsible for producing the drum sound on um, the pill stuff. Studio Four in town, or a studio called Townhouse, which was where Phil Collins did in the air tonight with that big drum sound. The room did that sound, so the top has that sound on it on the drums, and that conditions everything else you can do on the top. So if your drums are shit, your record's shit, basically. Yeah. Well, I love the sound of that album, but yeah, I think it's a bit underappreciated. Mm, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Ah, hello. Who are you? I'm called Loz. All right, Loz. Hello. I'm Loz from PDA Glue. Hi. Oh, cool. Hello there. Um, when you started producing, was it, did you kind of start with like kind of no knowledge and just took each opportunity as a reason to challenge yourself and kind of learn more? Or did you kind of go in with a pretty solid knowledge already? No, I had no knowledge at all. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. No, when, well, it's more like yeah. kind of, I think the first 10 yeah. years, you can have the script if you want it. The first 10 years yeah. I was very experimental because I didn't yeah. really know what I was doing. And I think when you don't really know what you're doing, your talent has to work. You've got no knowledge, so it just comes down to whether your talent yeah. can come to the fore. So I kind of guessed that I had a talent because I was able to make stuff happen even though I didn't know really what the fuck I was doing. Oh. Then later on, you get more and more knowledge. Your talent doesn't have to get out of bed. Ah. Right? Now, this is one of the reasons why I think we all generally tend to find that people's early work is more vital and interesting than their later work because their later work is informed by knowledge and their earlier work is informed by talent. I agree. I think so, that as well, so. actually, a lot of the time. Thank you. Okay, look, we've Thank been you. given the nod to stop, but we're not going anywhere. Um, let's all just come down to the floor because uh, there's, there's going to be another band on or whatever. So we'll, we'll be hanging around for, uh, if that's okay with you guys, uh, half an hour whatever, and they will be here to chat and um, you can ask all your questions face to face. Okay, yeah. awesome. okay thanks, thanks very th much, Andy. Mic drop. Thank you so much, Rough Trade. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dave and Phil. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to Record Store Day for being Record Store Day. And um, again, thank you, Rough Trade, for doing what you do. It's been an entire part of all of our childhoods and adulthoods. And good, good. there's nothing better than a good record shop. And I think we can all agree we're in one of the best in the world. Thank you. Andy Gardner on the mic.